Amen. All right there, Romans chapter number 4, verse number 1, the Bible reads, What shall we then say? What shall we say then that Abraham our father, as pertaining to the flesh, hath found? For if Abraham were justified by works, he hath whereof to glory, but not before God. So he asks a question here, and if you will, it's a doctrinal question. He asks a question about faith. What do we believe, right? He's wondering, what shall we say then that Abraham our father, as pertaining to the flesh, hath found? For if Abraham were justified by works, he hath whereof uh, to glory, but not before God. Now look at that phrase in the very beginning of verse number 3. This is where we find our answer. For what saith the scripture? Then he goes on to explain, Abraham believed God, and it was, account and it was counted unto him for righteousness. So we can see Paul setting the example that if we have a question about something that we believe, if we have a question about our faith, if we have a question about our doctrine, we appeal to the scripture. What saith the scripture? That is our authority. If you're wondering about, hey, what do I believe in this area? Go look at the Bible. Study that subject in the Bible. Find out what the Bible tells you to believe. Find out what God tells you to believe. Turn over to Galatians chapter number 4, verse number 30. Galatians chapter number 4, verse number 30. Galatians chapter number 4, verse number 30. We'll look at... Uh, We'll look at verse 27 first. For it is written, Rejoice thou barren that thou bearest not. Break forth and cry, thou that travailest not. For the desolate hath many more children than she which hath an husbandman. Verse 28. Now we, brethren, as Isaac was, are the children of promise. But as then he that was born after the flesh persecuted him that was born after the spirit. Even so it is now. Verse 30. Nevertheless, what saith the scripture? So again, when he wants to explain something to you, he stops and he says, nevertheless, so let's stop right here. What saith the scripture? And then he goes on, cast out the bondwoman and her son, for the son of the bondwoman shall not be heir with the son of the free woman. So notice that Paul, when he wants to explain something to you, he wants to prove something to you, he wants to teach something to you, what is his final authority? What does he go to immediately? The Bible. He quotes the scripture immediately. Now, we as a church, Independent Baptist, you'll oftentimes hear people say that the Bible, the King James Bible in particular, is our final authority in all matters of faith and practice. We see a couple examples right here of it being, all, it being the final authority of Paul and being set forth to be the final authority of us, right? As Christians, as believers, looking at his example in an area of faith. Today I'm going to be preaching about the King James Bible being our final authority in areas of practice. Why we do the things we do. Oftentimes tradition can be just handed down to people. Churches can just practice things. They can just go ahead and do things you know, that they're, the church that they were sent out from does. But that doesn't mean it's biblical. And that doesn't mean you should be doing that. And some of the things that we, the way that we operate here as an independent Baptist church, it's not... Because I picked these up from a particular person, it's not that my church did these, it's because the Bible teaches these things. And I'm going to go through point by point some of the things that we believe and some of the things that we practice as a church and show that the Bible is our authority in these areas. And we don't just, hey, this is our preference. Or, hey, we like to do this this way. You know, we like to practice this particular thing. No, everything that we do is based upon the Scripture. What saith the Scripture? I want you to turn, we're going to begin in Exodus chapter number 24, verse number 7. Exodus chapter number 24, verse number 7. Exodus chapter number 24, verse number 7. Every service before the preaching, we have someone come up and they will read the entire chapter that, that would be that the text is drawn from. We'll read an entire chapter of Scripture, and this is biblical. This is something that has taken place all the way back to the time of Moses, when the children were in the wilderness. They would stand up and they would read Scripture to the audience or the congregation, the Christians, if you will. Look at Exodus chapter number 24, verse number 7. Exodus chapter 24, verse number 7, it says, And he took the book of the covenant, referring to the law, it says, And read in the audience of the people... And they said, all that the Lord has said will we do and be obedient. I want you to turn over to Nehemiah chapter number 8, verse number 3. Ne Nehemiah chapter number 8, verse number 3. Nehemiah chapter number 8, verse number 3. This is long after Moses, after the children of Israel had, been, had settled in in the promised land. They were then... 
afterwards carried away into Babylon, and then they came back at the time of Nehemiah, same time of Ezra. Look here in Nehemiah chapter 8, we'll begin reading in verse number 1. And all the people gathered themselves together as one man into the street that was before the water gate. And they spake unto Ezra the scribe to bring the book of the law of Moses. So that's what we saw Moses reading in Exodus chapter number 24, right? He stood before the audience, he stood before the congregation, and he read the scriptures before all the people, right? So we can see this taking place again. He's got the law, everyone gathered together, the book of the law. It says, to bring the book of the law of Moses, which the Lord had commanded to Israel. Verse number 2. And Ezra the priest brought the law before the congregation, both of men and women, and all that could hear with understanding upon the first day of the seventh month. And it says in verse number 3. And he read therein before the street that was before the water gate from the morning until midday, before the men and the women it says, and those that can understand in the ears of all the people were attentive unto the, book of, unto the book of the law. So we can see this taking place many, many hundreds of years later on. We see Nehemiah practicing this, this, this exact same thing. Turn over to Nehemiah chapter number 13. We'll see it again mentioned. Nehemiah chapter number 13. Look at just verse number 1. It says, on that day they read in the book of Moses in the audience of the people, and therein was found written that the Ammonite and the Moabites should not come into the congregation of God forever. Now, how did they discover that? Why? Because they sat down, they opened up the Bible, and they just began reading it. And they saw, hey, there's a truth in here that we were missing. And what, when were they doing it? They were reading it in front of all the congregation. They were reading it to all the people. Turn over to, uh, let's go to the New Testament. Go to Luke chapter number 4. Luke chapter number 4. See, the time of Christ when he was here, they practiced this exact procedure of standing up before the people and reading the scripture again. Luke chapter number 4, and we'll look at verse number 14. And Jesus returned in the, in the power of the Spirit into Galilee, and there went out a fame of him through, I'm sorry, went out a fame of him through all the region round about. And he taught in their synagogues, being glorified of all. Verse number 16. And he came to Nazareth, where he had been brought up. And as his custom was, so as he was used to do, the Bible will say sometimes, as he usually does, this is his routine, if you will. As his custom was, he went into the synagogue on the Sabbath day, it says, and stood up for to read. So we can see that this tradition, if you will, carried on even into the time of Christ, where people would gather together on the Sabbath day. The congregation would come together, and Jesus Christ himself would come in. He would open up the book of the law. He would open up the prophets. He would open up, and, and here in particular, if you keep reading, he reads the book of Isaiah. And he'll open up in front of everyone the Bible, and he would read the Bible. Turn to uh, 1 Timothy chapter number 4, verse number 13. This is actually a commandment that was given to a pastor, which was ordained by the apostle Paul. To read, to give attendance to reading, the Bible says. Look at 1 Timothy chapter number 4. Look at verse number 11 first. He says, These things command and teach. Let no man despise thy youth. So notice he's addressing in context of preaching the Bible, of teaching other people, of commanding other people. Of course, in the context of the congregation being gathered together. He says, Let no man despise thy youth, but be thou an example of the believers in word, in conversation, in charity, in spirit, in faith, in purity. He says in verse number 13, Till I, go, till I come, give attendance to reading, to exhortation, to doctrine. So there's a couple of things about our practice that we can learn from that. Not only should you just be reading... That's what I'm focusing on right now, but you should also be preaching doctrine. You should be teaching the Bible, not just standing up and preaching what people want to hear or preaching a motivational message, which would be exhortation. You should do that. You should exhort people. But you should also stand up as a pastor and preach doctrine and teach people, right? But notice that first statement. He says, till I come, give attendance to reading. And that, that exact pattern we can see carried out throughout the Bible. So why do we read the Bible? Why do we have someone stand up here and open up the scriptures before I come up here and preach, before the pastor comes up here and preach? Because it's biblical. We don't just pick and choose, hey, this is a preference. I just like hearing the Bible. I do like hearing the Bible, but we do it for a reason. When Paul appeals, when he's speaking of faith matters, when he's speaking of belief matters, 
and he appeals to the scriptures, he's showing that is our authority. Hey, you want me to prove something to you? This is our authority. And this is what we should be able to do as Christians. If someone questions us, hey, at Valley Baptist Church, why do you do this? We should be able to point to scripture why we do that. If someone asks you the question, hey, why do you have someone stand up and read the Bible? Hey, because we, we have a pattern all throughout the Bible, beginning with Moses, standing up before the audience, before the congregation, opening up the book of the law. What does he do? He reads the scriptures. We see Nehemiah years later, right? After the, many, many years later, after carried into captivity, they're passing down this tradition. Now, the word tradition is not inherently bad. You can have a good tradition. As long as that tradition is based upon the Bible, you know, that's a tradition that I want to pass down upon to my children, right? That's a tradition that when the next pastor of this church comes, I want them to carry on the same traditions that we have now. I want them to keep doing those practices as long as they're based upon the Bible. Those are good traditions. We can see that Nehemiah continued that tradition. He stood up before the children of Israel, and just as Moses did, which was his example, he sat down and he didn't just preach. He opened up the Bible and he actually just read the Bible to them. He opened up the scripture and he just read the scriptures. Then what do you see the, you know, uh, the Apostle Paul commanding Timothy to do? He says, give attendance to read it. You see Jesus Christ during his life, he walks into the synagogue. What does he do? He gets the Bible, he opens it up to Isaiah, and he just begins reading. He doesn't just stand up there and just preach. We should preach as well. And we'll get to that in a minute. But we should just have a, a set, dedicated time as we can see this pattern in Scripture, which is our authority in practice, to where we have someone just stand up and read the Bible. And you know what? It's a shame that a lot of churches don't do this today. It's, it, you know, it really is. It truly is. I enjoy hearing. You know, even, you know, it, it benefits me to hear the, you know, the, the chapter one more time before I get up there and preach. But even when I wasn't pastoring, I enjoyed you know, just kind of relaxing and just listening to the Bible being read in my ears. I really enjoyed that. I like just hearing a full chapter, you know, being read to me. I love the Bible. And you know what? That may grow. That may, you know, cause the love of God's word in people's hearts to progress if more churches were to do this. If, if, if before the pastor got up and preached, you know, and, 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 it, and even worse than that, a lot of times the pastors aren't using a lot of Bible anyways. You know, they get up and they just use a couple of scriptures. How much more would it help those churches if just right beforehand they get a Bible, they open it up, and hey, let's read, you know, wherever we turn to, Romans chapter number four this morning. And, you know, that could compel someone as well to start reading their Bible. That could get you, hey, I enjoyed that. I want to go home and I want to read my Bible this afternoon. So it's important, and, and God does these things for practical purposes, and we should be attentive during the reading of God's Word. That's my last point in this subsection is that when we read the Bible, when we have the reading going on, we need to be attentive. Give attendance to reading. We need to be attentive to that. We need to be listening when the reading is going on. You know, don't be fooling around. Don't be pulling out your phone. Don't be checking on things. Try to listen during that time. Try to pay attention and listen to what is being read from God's Word. Turn in your Bibles to Mark chapter number 16, verse number 15. Mark chapter number 16, verse number 15. Why do we go out and preach the gospel? What's the reason that we go out and preach the gospel? Now, a lot of the points today in today's sermon, this morning's sermon is going to be somewhat simple to a lot of people, but there may be something that you haven't caught in some of these points today. But it's, it's something that we need to be refreshed with. It's something to be an area that we need to be refreshed in to know why we do what we do. That everything that we do is actually biblical. There are reasons and purposes why we do it. We don't just do it because we like to do it. We don't just do it just because it's a preference. We do it because God's word says, hey, do this. And that's what a practice is. It's an action. It's something that you are acting out. And our final authority in our practices is the word of God. That's why we do what we do. Amen. Mark chapter number 16, verse number 14 says this. Afterward, he appeared unto the eleven as they sat at meat. And upbraided them with their unbelief and hardness of heart, because they believed not them which had seen him after he was risen. Verse 15. And he said unto them, Go ye into all the world, and preach the gospel to every creature. Verse 16. He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved, but he that believeth not shall be damned. Verse number 17. And these signs shall follow them. That believe. Then he goes on and on and on. So notice in verse number 15, we have a commandment that's given. Let's look at the parallel of this. Go ahead and turn over to Matthew 28. But we have a commandment that is given to the apostles. 
Jesus Christ's disciples, and he tells them very clearly, go ye into the world and preach the gospel to every creature. Look at Matthew chapter number 28, verse number 19. Go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you. And lo, I am with you always, even unto the end of the world. So we see the commandment given, hey, go out and preach the gospel. If a church is not going out and preaching the gospel, if they don't have a set time or if they just aren't in any, whether it's structured or it's not structured, whether it's organized or not, it doesn't matter. If people from the church aren't going out and preaching the gospel, they're disobedient to Christ. Right. They are in direct disobedience to God's command. Before he left, hey, go out and preach the gospel. We don't just do these things because we like to do them. I want to say that over and over again. This is not a preference. This is not something that, hey, we're, you know, this is how we were trained. We do this because it's a commandment. Amen. Our Amen. church practices soul winning is because God, before he left, he commanded. Jesus Christ said, go ye, therefore, into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. It is a commandment to go out. One of our practices at our church is to go soul winning. We refer to it as soul winning because the Bible calls it soul winning. We do that because it's a command. This practice is not just something we enjoy doing, but it's a commandment. It's based upon our final authority. If our authority is the Bible, then we need to make sure that we're following everything the Bible says. In faith, but not only faith, not only our beliefs, also the, the practices that we do, the things that we do as a church. Amen. I want you to flip over to Mark chapter number 7. Mark chapter number 7, verse number 12. When we go soul winning, we do so in a very specific way. Mark chapter number 7, verse number 12. This does not look correct. Let's go to Luke chapter number 10, verse number 1. Luke chapter number 10, verse number 1. I know this one is correct. Luke chapter number 10, verse number 1. The Bible says, After these things the Lord appointed other seventy also, it says, and sent them two and two before his face into every city and place, whither he himself would come. He goes, he goes on there, verse number 2, Therefore said he unto them, The harvest truly is great, but the laborers are few. Uh, speaking specifically about those to preach the gospel, the laborers are few. There aren't many people preaching the gospel. He says, Pray ye therefore the Lord of the harvest that he would send forth laborers into his harvest. Continue reading, verse 3. Go your ways. Behold, I send you forth as lambs among wolves. Carry neither purse nor script nor shoes and salute no man by the way. And into whatsoever house ye enter, first say, Peace be to this house. And if the Son of Peace be there, your peace shall rest upon it. If not, it shall, excuse me, turn to you again. And he goes on, he gives them specific instructions. But I want you to notice there, specifically, in verse number 1, it says, After these things the Lord appointed other seventy also. Speaking of apostles, so Jesus Christ had handpicked twelve apostles. And after that... He chose 70 other also. Before he chose those 70 other, when he handpicked his first group of 12 apostles or disciples, he sent them forth to go preach the gospel. Then afterwards, he chose here, like we see in Luke 10, 1, 70 other also, and he sent them forth to go preach the gospel. Notice he gives a very specific command when they are to go forth. He says, after these things, the Lord appointed 70, other 70 also, and it says, and sent them two and two before his face, into every city and place whither he himself would come. When we go out soul winning and we have a big group, you know what we do? We break down into two and two. And we don't just do that just because we like to have the fellowship of our partner. We don't just do that just for safety purposes. And I'm sure that was, was instituted probably for some of those reasons. I'm sure Christ wants those things to happen for safety, for, you know, like I said, fellowship, other reasons. Maybe if you're at the door... One person can train the other. He can teach the other. If someone has a question and, you know, the guy that's actually speaking directly to that person at the time doesn't know the answer, you have another guy for a backup. There's many reasons. God's law is practical. God doesn't just pick and choose these things like, eh, three, two, I guess just two. Go ahead. You guys go. No, he has reasons why he does this, right? And he wants us, my point by saying that is he wants us to do it the way that he commanded it. So he didn't just randomly pick, hey, if you want to, do two and two. In, in the situations, obviously, sometimes, you know, we may be out there, just nobody shows up for soul winning. Obviously, it'd be best just go, one person, go by yourself, knock some doors. But when he has 70 people here, 
The way that God says, Jesus Christ says, break this up, the way that I'm going to send you forth is specifically two and two. And when we go soul winning here at Valley Baptist Church, we have a big, big, large group. Everybody's gathered together. You know what we do? We divide people into two and two. And we should be able to show people, like, hey, if somebody asks you a question, why do you guys do that? If there was someone that was not church, someone that especially didn't go to an independent Baptist church, never been soul winning, they come in, they, they start attending our church, and they go out soul winning with us. And they start seeing this pattern each week of, hey, why do you guys do this? Why do you guys do this? I know that if I was in their shoes and somebody opened up the Bible and was like, this is why. That'd be pretty cool. That'd be pretty interesting. Like, hey, this is a church that really cares what Jesus says. This is a church that tries, you know, to just dot every I and cross every T. We try to follow every practice that the Lord commanded his disciples. We try to follow every example that was given to the congregation and to the church. We don't only go soul winning because we enjoy it. We don't only go soul winning because we care about people. We go soul winning because Christ commanded the church to go soul winning. Not only when we go soul winning are we doing it because he commanded us to do it, we still try to follow each individual command that falls under that. And when we do so, we send people out two and two. I want you to turn your Bibles to 2 Timothy chapter number 4. 2 Timothy chapter number 4. 2 Timothy chapter number 4. So we take a lot of things for granted. You know, when you think of church, you just think of preaching. But why do we have someone stand up and preach? What's the reason? It should be based upon Scripture, right? God, you know, obviously there are particular reasons. And hypothetically, if, if one other way that God would have chose to do that, you would have, and, and, and you would have went to church your entire life. Let's say that we just went to church and we just read the Bible, just hypothetically, the entire time. You would have just taken that for granted, though that was the way that we were supposed to have church. Everyone understand what I'm saying? You take for granted all we do preaching, but why do we preach? You can't take these things for granted. You need to know from the Bible. What's the reason why we have a pulpit? What's the reason why we stand up here and we preach God's word? It's because the Bible commands a man of God to stand up and preach God's word. The Bible commands a pastor to stand up and preach God's word. It's biblical. Look at 2 Timothy chapter number 4. Verse number, we'll begin in verse number one. I charge thee therefore before God and the Lord Jesus Christ, who shall judge the quick and the dead at his appearing in his kingdom. And then he says in verse number two, preach the word, the instant in season, out of season, reprove, rebuke, exhort with all long suffering and doctrine. Now notice what he goes on to say. You can tell here he's not just preaching door to door. He's preaching to a congregation. He says point blank after that, verse number three. For the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine. So notice, he's preaching sound doctrine. He's speaking of a group of people. The time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine. Speaking of those in your church, speaking of the congregation. And what does he tell them to do? Preach the word. And then he lays out for you the type of preaching it should be. Preach the words. He says, be instant, in season, and out of season. What does it mean when something is in season or out of season? If you, if you think of like fashion. It means when it's popular and when it's not. If there's a certain dress or a certain pair of pants or something that's in season sometimes and out of season at another time. It's saying it, sometimes it's popular. Sometimes it's received by people, right? And then sometimes it's not. People reject it. But he's saying when people want to hear God's word, you preach it. But guess what? When people don't want to hear God's word, you preach it too. Amen. And then he goes on. He says, for the uh, right after that, be in season, in season, out of season. And then he explains... So it makes more sense once you finish reading this verse why sometimes people aren't going to want to hear it. What is, what is the recipe of preaching? Reprove, rebuke, exhort with all long suffering and doctrine. So notice, two-thirds of that are correcting someone. That should be a lot of the preaching. If a pastor is standing up behind the pulpit and he's never correcting anyone, he's never reproving anyone, he's never rebuking anyone, and a lot of even independent Baptist churches do this where they just stand up and they exhort over and over and over again, but then they want to tell you, you know, you want to ask them the question, why do you do what you do? Well, we do things uh, based upon the King James Bible. The King James Bible is our final authority in all matters of faith and practice. That's not true. Because that pastor's commanded, preach the word. And how, what recipe? How is he supposed to preach it? He's supposed to reprove, rebuke, and exhort. The style of preaching that we have here is because that is what's biblical. Amen. That is the pattern of all the people preaching throughout the Bible. You have examples of 
God gives a specific command. I don't have this in my notes, but to Ezekiel. And he tells him to stomp with the foot. Does everybody know what I'm talking about? And he says, smite with the hand. That's right. Does this sound like, like just some guy that's got a glass pulpit and he's standing up here sitting down speaking to you in a casual <laughs> manner? That, we have a specific style of preaching here. We preach the Bible in a particular manner because that is biblical. And the preaching, you know, it, you know, it should match the Bible in the first place. That's what's strange about these churches that stand up. And they, they, supposedly you're supposed to preach the entire Bible, right? That's what pastors should be doing. They should be preaching the Bible from beginning to end. All of God's Word. Then they'll stand up on the pulpit and every week they have a particular style of sermon that's a very mild-mannered, laid-back sermon. But here's the thing. A lot of the Bible's not mild. Yeah. A lot of the Bible is not moderate. A lot of the Bible is not laid-back. So that doesn't make sense. You, you know, you should be delivering the message. If Ezekiel stood up and he preached a hard message, it doesn't make sense to go back and preach what Ezekiel's preaching, but do it in a way in which you're not preaching the way he did. You're preaching in a very mild way. There are things in the Bible that are meant to be presented, you know, in a way of reproof. There are things in the Bible that are meant to be presented in a way of rebuke. Reproof would be a mild correction, right? It would be a, a, a softer correction. A rebuke is a hard, strong correction. Where you are correcting people strongly. And if you are not as a pastor standing up behind the pulpit and you are just never rebuking, you are never even reproving, the Bible is not your final authority in all matters of practice. Because this is a practice. This is something we do at church, right? This is something that we carry out. It's an action, right? It's an act. And we don't have this style of preaching because, hey, it's interesting. Hey, it's you know, entertaining. That's not why we do this. It's because we want to truly be as close to the Bible in all matters of faith and practice as we can. We try to lay everything upon the foundation of what saith the Scripture. What does the Bible teach and tell us to do? How should we preach the Bible? You know, what else should we do at church? We should read the Bible. What other practices should we do? We should do soul winning. Why? Because the Bible tells you to do it. Why do we do what we do? Because the Bible commands these things. I want you to turn to another verse here. Let's look at Acts chapter number 20, verse number 9. Acts chapter number 20, verse number 9. See this example from Paul. Paul was the one writing to Timothy. And look here in Acts chapter number 20. Let's begin reading first in verse number 7. It says, And upon the first day of the week when the disciples came together to break bread. So notice the disciples are coming together. What would you consider this? What do you think of? Congregating, right? You think of a congregation, you think of a church, right? It says they come together to break bread. Paul preached unto them, ready to depart on the morrow. So you see, when everybody comes together, what's happening? Paul's preaching, right? He's preaching to them. Paul preached unto them, ready to depart on the morrow. So he's going to be leaving the next day. And it says, and he continued his speech until midnight. You guys want to complain about me preaching too long. Paul <laughs> preached till midnight. Yeah. Look, at, look at what it says right here. I'm just kidding. Nobody's complaining about that. It's at verse 8. And there were many lights in the upper chamber where they were gathered together. And there sat in a widow a certain young man named Eutychus, being fallen into a deep sleep. And as Paul was long preaching, so he just keeps going on. He just keeps preaching. Like that Godhead series. Long preaching says he sunk down with sleep and fell down from the third loft and was taken up dead. We need to get like a sign. That like hangs up and says, remember Eutychus. So that nobody falls asleep in our church here. But you can see here that this is biblical. Amen. Paul stands up for hours. And he just, what he does what? He just preaches the Bible. Preaches the Bible. Preaches the Bible. It says he, when he was long preaching. So he went on for a long time. It says until midnight. I mean, I don't know when they started, but he was long preaching. Probably 7, 8 o'clock. I mean, he's preaching for 4 or 5 hours, right? That's a long time. Why do we preach the Bible when people are gathered together? Because it's biblical. What's the reason why? Do we just enjoy it? I hope you enjoy it, but that's not the reason why. It's because it's biblical. It's right. because we see Paul doing what? Everybody gathers together. He's going to be leaving tomorrow, so they gather together to have church. And then Paul stands up and he preaches for, for a long time, four or five hours, however long it was, but it's stressing until midnight. He's long preaching. So he, we see here that Paul sets that example by writing, to, or he sets the example by preaching Right? To the congregation, and then he writes to Timothy. He tells Timothy, preach the word. I want you to turn to another scripture here. Go to Psalm chapter number 40, verse number 9. You can actually see this in the Old Testament as well. Psalm chapter number 40, verse number 9. Psalm chapter number 40, verse number 9. I'll look at that later. 
Psalm chapter number 40, verse number 9. The Bible reads, he says, I have preached righteousness in the great congregation. And he says, Lo, I have not refrained my lips, O Lord, thou knowest. So notice what he says. He says, I have, is he just preaching door to door? Is he just preaching to his family? No, it says, David says specifically, I have preached righteousness in the great congregation. So what particular setting, what particular layout are they doing this? It's when everybody's congregated together. It's when they have church. It says that David preached righteousness. And if he's preaching righteousness, what is he preaching? He's preaching the Bible, right? He's preaching God's word. That's what he's doing. You know, this is righteousness right here. I want you to turn to another passage. Let's look at this real quick. Acts chapter number 1, verse number 13. Acts chapter number 1, verse number 13. I want to show you this pattern when people are gathered together. We see preaching. The, when the congregation comes together, when they're having church, they're always preaching. We should be giving attendance to reading, but there should also be preaching. There should be preaching of the Bible. When people preach the Bible, they should be preaching righteousness. They should be preaching reproof, exhorting people. They should be rebuking. Look at Acts chapter number 1. Look at verse number 13. Acts chapter 1, verse number 13. It says, And when they were come in, they went up into an upper room, where abode both Peter and James and John and Andrew and Philip and Thomas and Bartholomew and Matthew, James the son of Alphaeus and Simon Zelotes and Judas the brother of James. These all continued with one accord in prayer and supplication with the women and Mary the mother of Jesus and with his brethren. So we can see they're congregated together. The church is gathered together. And in those days, verse 15, and in those days Peter stood up in the midst of the disciples and said, the number of names together were about 120. So there's many other people that are not mentioned here that are in attendance at this, right? So the congregation, the church is gathered together. He says he stood up in the midst of the disciples. It says in verse 16, Men and brethren, this scripture must needs have been fulfilled, which the Holy Ghost by the mouth of David spake before concerning Judas, it says, which was guide to them. That took Jesus. So this is a perfect example of something you just might read over where the congregation is gathered together. And then you have Peter, who is the leader of all the disciples. He, he, you know, he would be what would, what would seem to be maybe the pastor of the church that ended up being at Jerusalem. The elder of the church that ended up being at Jerusalem, which is where they're located now. The elder or the pastor stands up and what does he do to the congregation? What does he do when there's 120 people there? They're all gathered together. They're fellowshipping. He stands up and he just starts preaching what? And what is he doing? He's preaching the Bible. See, immediately, what's he start quoting? He's obviously speaking of things that had just happened, but this was the routine. We see that all throughout the Bible where the pastor stands up and he preaches. He continues on and keeps quoting scripture, right? I want you to turn over to Colossians chapter number 3, verse number 16. So that is why we preach the Bible. That is why we preach God's word when we gather together. Keep your hand in Colossians chapter number 3. I want you to go over to Ephesians chapter number 9. I'm sorry, 5. Ephesians chapter number 5, verse 19. So this is a parallel. Look at uh, Ephesians chapter number 5, verse number 19. <clears throat> the Bible reads, look at verse 18 first. And be not drunk with wine wherein is excess, but be filled with the Spirit. And then he tells you how to be filled with the Spirit. Verse 19. Speaking to yourselves in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody in your heart to the Lord. So you can see the command there where he tells those that he's writing to the church at Ephesus. He says, speaking to yourselves in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody in your heart to the Lord. Flip over to Colossians chapter number 3. Colossians chapter number 3, it's verse number 16. Look at verse number 16 again. It says, let the word of Christ dwell in you richly in all wisdom. So notice that statement, how he begins out. He's, he's, what he's getting ready to talk about is going to have to do with the word of God because he's explaining, he's exhorting to them, let the word of God dwell in you richly. Right? So whatever this act or practice we're getting ready to read about, it's going to have to do, it's going to help you, uh, uh, it's going to allow you to have the word of God dwell in your heart. So he says, let the word of Christ dwell in you richly in all wisdom, teaching and admonishing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing with grace in your hearts to the Lord. I want you to notice here, when we compare the two scriptures, the scriptures, the, 
Ephesians chapter number 5, it spoke of the Holy Spirit, walking in the Holy Spirit, being filled with the Holy Spirit, right? Then we flip over here in verse number 16, and he says, let the word of Christ dwell in you richly. When he, after he explains to you uh, that he wants you to allow the, whole, the, uh, the word of Christ to dwell in you, he tells you how you are going to do that. And he says this, admonishing one another in psalms, and he says, and hymns, and spiritual songs. That tells me that psalms, of course, which is fully the word of God, totally the word of God, it's just all the words of God, right? That tells me that what we're about to do is going to have to do with the word of God. He starts off with the psalms. It is the word of God, right? Spoken by the mouth of David through the Holy Spirit. Then notice next, and hymns. So what should hymns contain if we're going to be allowing, you know, the word of God to dwell in us? What should the hymns contain? They should be containing scripture, right? They should have scripture in them. And then he concludes in spiritual songs, singing with grace in your hearts to the Lord. So why do we sing hymns? What's the purpose? Why do we sing hymns here? Because it's commanded, number one. That's the first command. Why do, why do we sing hymns? Because it is commanded. We see that commanded in Ephesians chapter number five. And we can see it commanded in Colossians chapter number three. We should also uh, you know, be singing songs as well. We should also work it out to where we maybe people at our church can write psalms, can take psalms and put them to music. It is a commandment, so we would like to definitely do that, right? It, everything that we do should be based upon the Bible. Every practice that we have, and somebody might come in here and say, hey, that's weird that you guys you know, sing psalms. Or that's weird that you guys sing hymns. And what will you do? Open it up, Colossians chapter 3, verse 16. Like, hey, we didn't come up with this, buddy. This is a commandment to the church. There's a reason why we do this. We didn't just, it's not just that we enjoy this music. I love the hymns. I love, you know, the songs. I love, you know, spiritual songs. I love God, you know, all the songs, especially the hymns that have just a lot of God's word pumped into them. When you read the hymns, you can tell these people knew the Bible. A lot of the people you can tell, they knew the Bible. They write about, you know, and, and a lot of them have, most of them, the the vast majority of them have correct doctrine. And you can learn from them. Look at what this says right here, verse 16. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly in all wisdom. Notice that. In all wisdom. And then he says this, teaching and admonishing one another. We should be singing songs that actually teach us something. You know, we should be singing songs that have doctrine in them. If you're, you know, that's what doctrine means. It means to teach, right? And when we sing the hymns, they're packed full of doctrine. They are. All the hymns. You find things in there constantly. We're always referencing things like, hey, did you notice this? Did you notice that in this hymn? Did you notice this in that hymn? I mean, they're based upon Scripture. And God's Word commands us to sing, it says, psalms and hymns and spiritual songs. And if we are a church that says, hey, the King James Bible is our final authority in all matters of faith and practice, we need to be singing psalms. We need to be singing hymns. We need to be singing spiritual songs. Flip over to uh, Matthew chapter number 26, verse number 30. Matthew chapter number 26, verse number 30. So we saw the direct command to sing psalms. Here I want to show you that, that this is actually what the disciples did as well. Matthew chapter number 26, verse number 30. Matthew chapter number 26, verse number 30. Jesus speaking, we'll read verse 28, just to get context. It's after the uh, Lord's Supper. For this is my blood of the new covenant, of the new testament, which is shed for many for the remission of sins. But I say unto you, I will not drink henceforth of this fruit of the vine until that day when I drink it new with you in my Father's kingdom. It says in verse 30, after the Lord's Supper, it says, And when they had sung in him, they went out into the Mount of Olives. That'd be cool to be there and see something like that. All the apostles, all the disciples go out. I'm sure they're singing loud because that's a commandment as well in the Old Testament. And they just sing a hymn. They sing a hymn. They sing what, the, what we are commanded to do, psalms and hymns and spiritual songs. We saw uh, Paul writing to Timothy and commanding him, hey, preach the word. But then we saw Paul also giving us that example. We have the commandment written by Paul again, Colossians, chapter number, uh, Colossians and uh, uh, also Ephesians. Giving us the command, hey, sing in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs. Then what do we do? We look and we see that, that Jesus set this example for us. We see that Jesus and the disciples, the apostles, they gather together after they had the Lord's Supper. And they gather together and they just sang a hymn. They're like, hey, let's sing a hymn real quick. Why do we sing hymns? Because the Bible commands us to do so. Why do we sing hymns? Because we have the example of Jesus Christ, the apostles, the disciples. When the church was gathered together, you know what they did? They sang a hymn. 
That's why we sing hymns. It's, it's not just because we enjoy the music. I love hymns. That's not the only reason. I want to bang this into your head. We do this because it's biblical. That's the reason. And you know what? If we found out, hey, that's not biblical, we'd stop doing it. I would stop doing it. If we found out, hey, something that we're doing right now is not biblical, we would stop doing it. You understand what I'm saying? I want to strive to make sure that our church is based upon the example of the church that Christ set forth. The example of the church that Christ established while he was on this earth with the disciples. And the examples that he gave of the New Testament church all throughout scripture. I want to strive to follow that pattern of the Bible for the Bible to be our final authority. Not just in faith, not just in our beliefs on the Godhead or whatever it may be. But also in practice. Whatever we actually do, I want to be doing it because it's based upon scripture. I want you to turn in your Bibles quickly to go back to Psalm chapter number... 150, Psalm chapter number 150. So why do we have musical instruments? Look at Psalm chapter number 150. We're supposed to, we're commanded to sing, sing the psalms. Well, look at Psalm chapter number 150. It says, praise ye the Lord, praise God in his sanctuary, praise him in the firmament of his power, praise him for his mighty acts, praise him according to his excellent greatness, praise him with the sound of the trumpet, praise him with the psaltery and harp. Excuse me, praise him with the timbrel and dance, praise him with stringed instruments and organs, praise him, praise him upon the loud, the loud cymbals, praise him upon the high sounding cymbals. And then he says, let everything that hath breath praise the Lord, praise ye the Lord. We look at the Psalms in the Old Testament, we see the example all throughout the Psalms, not just here, all throughout the book of Psalms, where God will speak of praising him. I mean, obviously, he's speaking through, through David. The Holy Spirit writes to praise God on musical instruments. That's why we use musical instruments. A lot of churches that will say, hey, you know, Church of Christ as an example, they do not use musical instruments. They think that that is wrong. That is incorrect. We can see that in the New Testament, we are commanded to sing psalms. When you go back and you look at some of the psalms, very often the psalms will tell you to, to praise God on an instrument particularly. That would be very awkward and very weird to be singing a song that everyone in the whole church knows, like, we are adamantly against instruments. And then you're just, like, singing a song. Obviously, you wouldn't be playing an instrument. But you're, like, everybody's just, like, singing a song that's about praise him on this instrument, praise him on this instrument. Everybody's kind of, like, looking around, like, you know, this is awkward, right? It doesn't make sense. God commands them to sing the songs, and then you go back to the songs, and there are particular commands to praise him on instruments. Maybe he's trying to tell you something. Use instruments, right? right? Psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs. I believe that that, when it says spiritual songs, is a summary of the first two that are preceding it. Psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs. He told you, hey, be filled with the word of God. And what did Jesus say about, about his words? He said, the words that I speak unto you, they are spirit and they are life. When he says spiritual songs, that is a summary of psalms and hymns. Therefore, psalms and hymns, obviously hymns, psalms we know are going to be the word of God. The hymns that we sing should be, in, like they are in our hymnal, they should contain the word of God. The spiritual songs are talking about songs that contain. How do you make something spiritual? People don't really understand that word a lot of times when you speak to them. Like, man, you know, like, especially, like, people that will attend, like, new evangelical churches and stuff like that, they just, like, throw the word spiritual around and they have no clue what that means. Do you know what spiritual means? The word of God. It means it came, it's breath of God. That's what spirit is. The word breath and spirit are used interchangeably over and over again. Over and over again. You know what makes something spiritual is God's word. Amen. That's why it tells you in one passage, hey, be filled with the spirit. Then you, and that's in Ephesians 5. Then you flip over to Colossians 3, and what does he tell them? He tells them, hey, be filled with the word of God. And he says, how are you going to do it? Sing psalms and hymns. And then he says, spiritual songs. Very often in the Bible, the Bible gives you a list of something, Right? You know, uh, it talks about in the book of Hebrews. I can't remember exactly. I, I, I had this memorized at one point. Do you know what it is? Remember that verse that I quoted that one time when I preached on this particularly? It talks about, um, you know, uh, divers, drinks, and washings. And then he summarizes the list with and carnal ordinances. So the Bible does that very often where it will list a couple of things, right? Meats and di you know, divers, meats, and something. And then he says, and, and washings, and he says, and carnal ordinances. You know... The meats are carnal ordinances. The washings are carnal ordinances. You understand what I'm saying? That list there, psalms and hymns, it summarized all of it in spiritual psalms. Because he's telling you, be filled with the Spirit. Be filled with the Word of God. And how are you going to do so? By singing the psalms, which is the Word of God. 
and then by singing the hymns, which are, they should be at least, the word of God. If we're going to sing them, the whole purpose is to be, would it make sense to have a hymnal if we purchased a hymnal that's just like doesn't contain God's word? It's never like teaching or admonishing us. No, we pick a hymnal, we use a hymnal that has God's word in it, right? Because we want to be filled with the spirit. And how do we do so? By having God's word in your mouth. That's how you do so. If you want to walk in the Spirit, you read the Bible. You put the Bible in your mind. You put the Bible and you hide it in your heart. That will enable you to walk in the Spirit daily. I want you to go over to John chapter number 3, verse number 23. This next one we'll go through pretty quickly. We're all very familiar with this. John chapter number 3, verse number 23. One of our main practices is baptism. We saw in Matthew 28 and Mark 16, Christ sent them forth to baptize. We do so in a particular manner. We immerse. There are churches that sprinkle that is unbiblical. The reason why we don't sprinkle is because it's not biblical. Because the Bible is our final authority. In all matters of faith, not only faith, practice. Look at John chapter number 3, verse number 22. The Bible says, After these things came Jesus and his disciples into the land of Judea, and there he tarried with them and baptized. It says in verse number 23, And John, speaking of John the Baptist, also was baptizing in Anon, so, they, so it says that Jesus and his disciples went there, and then it says that John was also there. Now it's going to tell you why you know, it seemed to be a coincidence. Why did both of them pick this one spot, right? And John also was <laughs> back baptizing in Anon near to Salem. It says because there was much water there. It says, and they came and were baptized. Now if you had to, if, if, if baptism, if the recipe or the method of baptism was sprinkling, would you need much water? No, it's, it's telling you, it's explaining to you that much water is needed so that the person can be immersed. So you can have enough water to where the person can be baptized. And actually, the definition of the word baptized, I, I didn't read this full thing. I don't think I did. But in that uh, 1660 London Confession of Faith, I don't, I don't believe I, I, I read this part to you. But when under the section of baptism that I read Sunday night... It actually explains and defines, it says, you know, when it uses the word baptize, it has parentheses and it says to dip. That's actually the definition of the word baptism or to baptize. It means to immerse. It means to dip or to put someone under. That's what it actually means. I want you to go back to, uh, go to Matthew chapter number three and we'll see that again. Matthew chapter number three. Matthew chapter number three. Look at Matthew chapter number 3, look at verse number 13. It says, Then cometh Jesus from Galilee to Jordan unto John to be baptized of him. So this is Jesus Christ's baptism by John the Baptist. Verse 14, But John forbade him, saying, I have need to be baptized of thee, and comest thou to me? Verse 15, And Jesus answering said unto him, Suffer it to be so. He's saying, Allow it, right? Baptize me. Suffer it to be so, for thus it becometh us to fulfill all righteousness. Then he suffered him. Verse 16, And Jesus, when he was baptized, it says, went up straightway out of the water. So notice at the moment that Jesus Christ is baptized, it says he went up straightway out of the water. So if he's coming out of the water, where was he? He was down in the water, right? So the reason why when we baptize, we immerse people, it's because it's scriptural. Right? It's because we can point to Scripture and I can prove to you from a clear Scripture why they did so. In the book of Acts, chapter number 8, I don't think I have it. I'm not going to turn there, though, because I want to go through this quickly. I have one other point I want to spend a lot of time on, so I'll just give you this real quick. Acts, chapter number 8, when Philip and the Ethiopian eunuch are speaking, the uh, Ethiopian eunuch ends up getting saved. And he asks the question, you know, see, here's water. What doth hinder me from being baptized? It says when he baptizes them that they go down into the water. What's the purpose of that? Why did John the Baptist go somewhere where there was much water so that he could get all the way down into the water? When he says, hey, they're going down into the water, it's so that he can take him down deep enough to where he's able to dip him or immerse him, right? Because that is the definition of baptism. Like Jesus Christ, when it records his baptism, what happens? He comes up out of the water. Romans chapter number 6 actually explains to you the purpose, and you can compare that to 1 Peter 3, the purpose of baptism and why we do it and what it actually represents. And it is, in fact, a representation of Jesus Christ's death. You're hanging on the cross, right? You are being crucified with Christ, if you will. It represents, this is what I'm trusting for my salvation. His death, his burial, and he's fully buried. He was fully in the tomb, right? Not just part of his body. He wasn't hanging halfway in there. He was fully put in the tomb. His death, 
his burial all the way under the water, and then his resurrection. He raises again from the dead. You can look at that in Romans chapter number 6 there in the first few verses. And then also it's talking about Jesus' resurrection being a light figure in 1 Peter chapter number 3. Now I want you to go ahead, I want you to turn to, um, we'll skip this one point. Go, go to Joshua chapter number 8, verse number 34. Joshua chapter number 8, verse number 34. Joshua 8, verse 34. One of the things that we do, a lot of these things that I've spoken of this morning, a lot of independent Baptists would agree with, right? But there's one thing that for some odd reason, a lot of independent Baptists, a lot of churches in general are, are you know, um, extremely against. They're very much against. And that is having integrated services. Having family integrated services. That is having all of the family together in one area, hearing the same preaching all at the same time, not separating the children from the parent, not taking the children and putting them into another room, and having a separate Bible lesson for the children, but rather the same preaching, the same Bible for everyone. And this is very clear from, beginning of, from the beginning of the Bible to the end of the Bible. You can see this in the Old Testament, and you can see this in the New Testament. People may look at us and think that's weird. You know, that is strange. You know, you can tell people sometimes when they come into a family integrated church, they're looking around and they're thinking, this is, this is different. You know, this is odd. You know, and I know when I grew up, I was in children's church all the time. You know, drink, sipping on some, you know, punch and eating cookies. I don't know anybody who grew up in church, but that's what I did. And, you know, uh... Yeah, and I'll tell you, I'll go ahead and say this too. The reason why, you know, and I'm, I don't want to bad mouth the church that I grew up in. It's a great church in a lot of ways, but they have a nursery that they have, right? And when, when Jessica and I started really, you know, in a dedicated manner going to church constantly, all the time, serving God, reading our Bibles every day, praying, just trying to serve God. We, when we just, you know, converted our lives, we had Michaela in nursery. Okay, and maybe for like eight, nine months, this is ever before I ever heard that, that guy's name in Arizona. Yeah. And I figured this out all on my own, and, and I asked Michaela, I was already thinking about it. You know, I was already, it just felt like, I, I don't know what it was. Maybe the Holy Spirit, I don't know what it was. But I, I was already thinking about how I, it just didn't feel right putting her in the nursery. I wanted her to sit with us. I wanted her to hear the preaching. And I asked a question. I don't know if Jessica remembers this or not. We were driving, and I asked Michaela a question. I said, what did you learn about today? And she said, we learned about Noah's Ark. And I said, what was Noah's Ark about? And she said, it was about animals. And I turned to Jessica and I said, she's not going back to the nursery again. Immediately. And that was when we stopped. And then I, you know, found out about Tempe, Arizona, maybe like, it was probably a year after that. So I had decided she was not going in the nursery ever, any, any at all after that. And the reason is because the nurseries, the children's churches, you know, the, the teenage classes, whatever they want to call those classes, they are not teaching those kids the Bible. You can say whatever you want. Hey, maybe you can find exceptions in some churches. Number one, it's not biblical. And I'm going to show you that here in just a minute. But the, the main problem with the children's churches, with these, you know, these nurseries and stuff, is because they just put the kids in there to get them out of the parent's hair while the parent sits down and learns the Bible. And they don't give a crap about the kids. They're not in there to try to, uh, you know, benefit the child and his spiritual well-being. They're trying to just keep the kid quiet. They're trying to just keep the kid satisfied and keep the kid happy. And they don't have people that are qualified in there in the first place teaching the Bible. They don't have, you know, someone that has went through the training, that studies the Bible, understands and knows the Bible, teaching the Bible. A lot of times it's women in there, which is not scriptural and not biblical either. They're in there teaching the Bible. But that's the biggest issue is that the kids are not learning the Bible. Right. And people act very weird about this. That, you know, well, they, you know, about, about children. They have this warped idea like the kids aren't learning the Bible when they're sitting in the services. I ask my children uh, you know, about the preaching that we'll listen to, and they'll give me answers and surprise me constantly all the time. They're hearing the preaching. They're hearing God's Word, and they're learning things. And I guarantee... You know, our children, if we were matching them up with these kids, that supposedly they have a dedicated preacher that's supposed to be putting things on their level, supposed to be laying it out to make it to where it's much easier. I guarantee all of our children, you could take them and compare them to one of these churches that have a children's church, that have a nursery. Our kids know the Bible a million times better than those right. kids. And a major reason is because they get to just listen to, the, you know, just the unadulterated Word of God just preached. 
Amen. You know, nothing has changed. Nothing is, you know, you know, they're not leaving parts out. You know, they're not tailoring it to make it for a kid. There isn't a Bible for children and then a Bible for adults. There's one Bible. Right, and right. they should be hearing that one Bible preached. When my daughter started reading the Bible, you know, I didn't go buy her something that's easier. I didn't go buy her an NIV or something like that. I, I gave her a King James Bible and she started reading that. Amen. And she can understand it. Look at Joshua chapter number 8. Joshua chapter number 8. Look at verse number 34. Here at the end. Joshua chapter number 8. Look at verse number 32. It says, and he wrote... And he wrote there upon the stones a copy of the law of Moses, which he wrote in the presence of the children of Israel. That's even an interesting concept right there. He sits down in the presence of Israel. So while like the children of Israel are sitting there, he just sits down and writes a copy. That would take a long time of the law. So it says in the presence of Israel, it says verse 33 of the children of Israel, I'm sorry, verse number 33, and all Israel and their elders and officers and their judges stood on this side of the ark and on that side before the priests, the Levites, which bear the ark of the covenant of the Lord, as well the stranger, as he that was born among them, half of them over against Mount Gerizim and half of them over against Mount Ebal, as Moses, the servant of the Lord, had commanded before that they should bless the people of Israel. Now look at verse number 34. And afterward he read all the words of the law, the blessings and cursings according to all that is written in the book of the law, Verse 35, there was not a word of all that Moses commanded, which Joshua read not, before all the congregation of Israel. So he told you it's before all the congregation of Israel. Now watch, he gets specific here. With the women, he says, and the little ones, and the strangers that were conversant among them. So we see here an example in the book of Joshua, after Moses had deceased, we see the congregation, the children of Israel gather together. What does Joshua do? He opens up the word of the law. He opens up the, the book of Moses, as it's referred to sometimes, and he just reads Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy to everyone. Now, one thing that you'll notice is that it tells you that all of them are there, and then it gives you specifics. It says, all the congregation of Israel with the women, and then it says this, and the little ones. Why do we have the little ones? Why do we have the children in our services? Why don't we convert my office into a nursery where somebody can go in there and teach them the Bible? Because the Bible actually tells you, the Bible actually sets forth the example that the children should be in the same congregation. We see Joshua, we see Moses, everyone gathering together, and all, they bring all of their kids. They don't have this dedicated area. They don't have a dedicated person that's going to go watch all the children. They bring all the little ones there too and they just read the book of the law. Notice that the message isn't tailored either. Notice what it said in verse 34. And afterward he read all the words of the law. It says the blessings and the cursings. Amen. So he's reading all the Bible. The hard stuff. The stuff that's difficult to read. The stuff that is easier to read. He's reading the softer stuff. And then guess what? He's reading the stuff that would be considered rebukes. He's reading the cursings of the law, right? It says, according to all that is written in the book of the law. Now, verse 35, he wants to stress this. Did he leave out maybe some parts for the little kids? No. There was not a word of all that Moses commanded, which Joshua read not before all the congregation of Israel. So notice how he connects that. He says, there wasn't a word that, Joshua, that Moses wrote down that Joshua didn't read before all the congregation. And then that's when he says, with the women and the little ones present. With the women and their children. Why do we have the children in here for all of the preaching? And, you know, and a lot of these new evangelical churches would say if they were to hear some of the messages, oh my goodness, I've even seen people say this in YouTube comments. Like, I can't believe you would preach about that with the children sitting in the, in the, um, the congregation. Are there, I hope there are children in there. I hope there are. Yeah. I hope they hear the blessings and the cursings. I Amen. hope they hear all of God's word. Amen. I hope they hear every bit of it. Amen. I want you to turn to another passage here. Let's look at a couple examples. Go back to Nehemiah chapter number 8. You may not have noticed this. The concept was actually also taught in Nehemiah chapter number 8. Where we read earlier, it says in Nehemiah chapter number 8, verse number 1 again, and, and all the people gathered themselves together as one man into the street that was before the water gate, and they spake unto Ezra the scribe to bring the book of the law of Moses, which the Lord had commanded to Israel. It says in verse 2, And Ezra the priest brought the law before the congregation. It says, Both men and women 
And all that could hear with understanding upon the first day of the seventh month. Verse 3. And he read therein before the street that was before the water gate from the morning until midday, before the men and the women and those that could understand, and the ears of all the people were attentive under the book of the law. Now when it talks about those that, that could understand, it's speaking of the fact if you read the book of Nehemiah and Ezra and you compare the two, it's talking about the fact that there were many people that, that were mingled in. That's actually how the book of Nehemiah and Ezra start to wrap up. is because they mingled in with the heathen. There were many people that did not speak the language at this time. So the people that didn't understand you know, the language of the Hebrews, those are the people that it's speaking of when it says everyone that could understand and those that could not understand. It's talking about the people that were mingled and did not speak the language. I want you to flip over to Nehemiah chapter number, I believe it's in 13 again. As well, Nehemiah chapter number 13, look at verse 1. On that day they read in the book of Moses in the audience of the people, and therein was found written that the Ammonite and the Moabite should not come into the congregation of God forever. I thought that it mentioned it right here as well. I want you to turn over to, go to 1 John chapter number 2, verse number 1. 1 John chapter number 2, verse number 1. Look at the New Testament example, and we'll go back again to the Old Testament for a couple other scriptures. 1 John chapter number 2. First John chapter number 2. Look at verse number 1. It says, My little children, these things write I unto you that you sin not. And if any man sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. Skip down to verse number uh, look at verse number 12. That's what I was looking for. 1 John chapter number 2, verse number 12. He says here, I write unto you, little children, because your sins are forgiven you for his name's sake. Look at verse number 13. He says, I write unto you, Father. So notice, he was, he was speaking specifically to children that were there. Because he addresses afterwards the fathers, those that are fathers. He says, first, I write unto you, little children. Now, when he's writing unto them, when he's writing unto the little children... This, that means that this letter, when they had congregation, when it was read, what had to take place? Children. The children had to be present. When they opened up the epistle of John, 1 John, if you will, and they opened it up, you know what that proves? That the fathers were there, and who else was there? The children were there. Everyone was gathered together. He opens it up, and he, he's able to do what? He's able to address the children. There's something, you know what that tells me? There's something for the children in the Bible. Amen. You know what else that tells me? There's something for the fathers. There's something for the mothers. There's something for each person. Go back to uh, Joel chapter number 2. Joel chapter number 2. Joel chapter number 2. And look at uh, verse number 15. He says, Blow the trumpet in Zion. Sanctify a fast. And he says this, call a solemn assembly. What would we refer to a, a, an assembly at? What do we call an assembly? Church, right, congregation. He's saying, blow the trumpet, make an alarm so everybody knows so we can all gather together for congregation, for church, right? He actually says that in verse 16. Gather the people, sanctify the congregation. Watch what he says next. Assume the elders, gather the children. And, and is it just the children? No, it wants to be very specific. And those that suck the breast. So when Joel actually makes the commandment, when God actually tells Joel to speak and to call an assembly for everyone to gather together, gather the people together, he says. And he says, sanctify the congregation. You know who shows up? The men are there. The women are there. Guess what? The children are there as well. And you say, oh, but what about those that are, you know, still nursing? They're there too. Those that right. suck the breast. Like in the book of Isaiah, when he talks about whom shall he teach knowledge, who shall he make to understand doctrine, he says they that are weaned from the breast. He talks about, you know, precept upon precept, line upon line, here a little and there a little. You begin teaching your children when they're babies. Amen. Right there, here a little and there a little, and they'll start getting it. They'll start catching it. There are things in the Bible for the children as well. There are things that they can understand and that they get, and you, you, you know, we kind of assume, and a lot of people assume, that they're just not listening. Even when they're, you know, they're yawning, they're turning around, they're shifting in their seat every five minutes. You can still ask them, and it'll surprise you, like, I didn't think you were listening at all. And they're still getting things from it. They're still under... And obviously, we should also make our children sit up. We should make our children listen. We should make sure that our kids are paying attention to the preaching, right? We should make sure that, hey, 
They're getting the most out of this that they can. They need to be present. The children need to be in the church. We don't need a separate section. We don't need a separate Bible teacher. We have one congregation and one church. And we see here the example set in the Bible biblically from beginning to end. All of them are gathered together. I'm going to end on this note right here. Go to Deuteronomy chapter number 31. He actually tells you the reason why, Deuteronomy chapter number 31, why it's important that the children are there for the preaching, why it's important that the children are there for God's word being preached, God's word being read, and they're in the congregation. Deuteronomy chapter number 31, look at verse number, Deuteronomy 31, verse number 11. Deuteronomy 31, verse 11. When all Israel has come to appear before the Lord thy God in the place, place which he shall choose, thou shalt read this law before all Israel, it says, in their hearing. So notice again, this is a pattern for when the congregation gathers together, right? This is a pattern. Jesus would, uh, you know, would go to the, the synagogue at his time, and he would read the Bible, right? When the congregation gathers together, he says there, that thou shalt read this law before all Israel in their hearing. Verse 12, gather the people together. That's the same statement from Joel 2. Gather the people together, men and women and children. So notice, it's a commandment that when the Bible is read in the congregation, that God wanted Moses to make sure that the men, the women, and children, what's his point? Everyone, no exceptions. Everyone is in the congregation. Make sure everyone is there. And he says, after that, and the stranger that is within thy gates. Now watch this. That. So that means consequently. I want them there so that this takes place. Watch what it says. That they may hear and that they may learn. Notice who was in that list just a moment ago. You want to tell me over and over again that children aren't learning anything. God tells me differently. He says that they may learn. After he just got done mentioning the children. He says that they may learn. Now watch this too as well. What are they learning? And fear the Lord your God, and observe to do all the words of this law. Notice that as well. All the words. There isn't something we need to cut out for them. There isn't something that they just can't handle. That we don't need to tailor the messages sometimes to the children, and sometimes to the adults, sometimes to the father, and sometimes to the mother. We need to stand up. We need to read all of the chapter that we're getting ready to preach from. We need to stand up and not say, hey, I'm not going to go up to Brother Russell and be like, hey, you know, uh, I want you to leave out these couple of verses when you go up there to read the Bible this time. Because they're just, they're just kind of, you know, they're kind of graphic or they're kind of, you know what I mean? You know, it talks about killing and stuff. Let's just leave those verses out. We're not going to do that. All those things were written in the book of the law. A lot of the wars are actually recorded. And actually what took place. And you know what God said to do? I want the men. I want the women. I want the strangers. And I want you to make sure you bring your children. And I want them all to hear it. And I want them to hear every word. Why? That they may learn. Don't tell me kids aren't learning. God says differently. Why do we do the things we do? Why do we go soul winning? Because the Bible tells us to go door to door. Why do we go two and two? Because the Bible actually teaches that Jesus, when he sent forth his disciples, and he instituted soul winning door to door, he said go two and two. Why do we baptize by immersion? Because that is the pattern that was laid forth. That is the commandment that was given when they were told to go forth baptizing. Why do we, you know, why do we have when, uh, before I come up here and preach, why do we have Brother Russell come up and read the Bible? Because we can see that pattern all throughout Scripture. Standing up and preaching or reading the Bible, you know, to the congregation. Why do, I, why do I preach the way that I preach? Why do we have a certain style of preaching? Because it's biblical. We don't, it's not because it's entertaining. That's not the reason why. You know, we try to match what the Bible teaches. What saith the scripture? That should be the question in all, in all matters of faith, not only what we believe, but also practice. Why do we have all the children in here? Why are all the children gathered together? Because God commanded it. In Deuteronomy chapter 31, he said, bring your kids. Make sure you bring your children that they may learn to fear the Lord their God. Amen. That tells me if your kids aren't going to be in it, they're in some other room and all they come away with... You know, you know what you know, made me say, hey, Michaela, you're not going in there anymore? What's the main point, the overall point? What was the purpose of Noah's flood? What was the point? To punish the world. You know what that could have done if she would have actually been taught correctly? My daughter? You know what she would have thought? Like, God is not a joke. Right. You know what I mean? Right. That God is someone to fear. Do you know why God himself said, gather your kids there? Because I want to make sure that they fear me. 
Amen. I want to make sure that they fear me. I, you know, we want our children to fear the Lord. Right. Amen. You want to have righteous children? You need to instill, instill in them, instill in them the fear of God. That, that is the recipe to get your children to obey God and to live a righteous, just life. Is to cause them to understand that God is someone to fear. That's why we have all the children here. There isn't parts that we want to cut out. I want my children to fear God. I want them to hear all of it. A lot of the parts where people are like, man, that's graphic. No, that's good. Let them hear this. It will cause them to fear God. You know, all these people are committing fornication and God's destroying them. You know, you have preachers that will just skip over that. No, read that for the children. Maybe they won't commit fornication when they grow up. Right. Right. These, these are, the, what's the reason why? I, I wanted to end on this point. What's the reason why we do all these things? Number one, let's say in the scriptures, we do it, all of our practices, for a particular reason because God says so and the Bible teaches it, but God has reasons why he wants to do that. God, you know, God wants you to hear the Bible read. God wants you to come to church and he wants you to hear the Bible read. God wants you to receive a certain style of preaching. God wants you to go soul winning. God wants your children in here so that they can learn God's word and so they can learn to fear him. So when you're not following the Bible in all matters of faith and practice, it's actually hindering you. We don't just, you know, God doesn't just tell you just because, hey, I just chose to do it this way. He has practical purposes and practical reasons. And he says, hey, have your children there, have the adults there, have everyone there, that. Consequently. So because of that, right? Because of that, here, this is what's going to happen. When they're all there, they're going to learn to fear. So when you're, when you're just, you know, not following a commandment, you're hindering yourself is the, po is the point. When we as a church, if we just decide, hey, I know better, or hey, I'm just going to start doing this at our church from now on, we're, we would be hindering ourselves. So we need to make sure as in our personal lives, but also as a church, that we are following all matters. The King James Bible is our final authority in all matters of faith and what we believe, right? Our doctrine, right? But practice as well, the way that we do things. Let's bow our heads and have a word of prayer. Heavenly Father God, we thank you, dear Lord for laying out for us uh, the, the correct doctrine, but not only the correct doctrine, dear Lord, the practices that we should carry out, the, the uh, traditions that we should pass down, dear Lord God. We love you. We thank you for caring about our children and, and desiring that they would fear you, dear Lord, and, and that they would walk in the steps of righteousness. We thank you for the Bible, and we ask you that we would just hold it in a high regard each day as we grow, and that we would use it for a final authority in our lives personally and as a church in all matters of faith and practice. And in Jesus Christ's name, amen. Amen.